Uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Daniel Schmachenberger. I think uh, there, if there was one person where people, where most people here were like, we need Daniel Schmachenberger on, or we need a specific person on, then it was really you. So I'm super, super happy uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that that you're coming on uh, and, and, and gracing us with, with your sense-making ability uh, today here. I think um, uh, there's a lot to cover. I'm not I'm pretending that we can cover everything in an hour, but uh, I'm hoping that we can at least scratch the surface and point people in the right directions if they want to follow up. Um, and yeah, I am hoping that, uh, I think initially when we spoke, we were thinking of taking this kind of all meta and talking about the generator function of X risk and, uh, and, and, and on kind of like, what are the, uh, I guess, like more abstract and long-term consequences from this. But uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, we have decided to kind of like, you pick us up where we are right now, uh, kind of like what are the threads that we should be unraveling more. And then we see kind of like how that uh, affects much of the generator functions of existential risk that you're so worried about. So thank you so, so much for, for coming on today. Daniel, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself whenever you want to as a co-host <laughs> and interrupt me. Thank you so, so much for joining. I would love for, for you to maybe kind of like fill us in um, by just kind of like taking us on, on a tour of, you know, what are kind of current developments where we're not paying enough attention to um, and uh, where the general conversation may be not paying enough attention to and that may have major implications down the line and that we shouldn't be missing right now. Thank you, Alison, for inviting me here. This is uh, my first of these to join, even though a number of the people that you've had on before, people I respect and are friends and colleagues. Um, I actually just want to acknowledge first what an awesome thing that you're doing here. Uh, and I look at the list of people that you've had on in the last 10 weeks and only 10% of these people are here for the first time. It's really kind of an incredible online university and a good use of this time. So that's really neat. Because I haven't been in the previous ones and the poll said people were feeling generally better, uh, many of them, and you were talking about existential hope and making opportunities. Can you just kind of clue me in briefly what some of the major themes of the COVID related make things better opportunities are that this group has been following? Yes, for sure. Okay, so there's uh, one I think that we may be even pursuing a little bit after uh, we close out the hive mind, which is kind of like the incredible opportunities uh, that are currently popping up on for health extension, right? Because suddenly uh, the whole world uh, is worried about uh, about their health, and a lot of the kind of biotech sector money that was already kind of like available beforehand is really uh, kind of like being funneled into vaccines that could, but some of that work could later be pivoted also into into general more more health and health extension. Uh, efforts. So that's on the one hand. Um, meanwhile, you know, uh, a lot of people are out of work and uh, kind of that uh, that may slow innovation down in the long run, uh, like quite significantly. Then I think on the other hand, what we talked about were kind of a few glimpses into the promises of the virtual world, right? Uh, we have everything from telemedicine in India to kind of like this, you know, really kind of like um, flourishing of global online universities uh, and such that may kind of like actually make it much harder for the general monopolies uh, of, of the kind of kind of broken educational systems uh, that rely on like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, foreign, uh, for, for foreign student payments uh, to survive that may, may make it much, much harder for them to kind of like still have this uh, almost like predatory, uh, predatory hinge on the system. So it was a lot of like, what are, what opportunities in the virtual space are possible right now, now that VR is almost becoming as good as a uh, human, uh, um, uh, as a brain computer interface. And then, you know, we also talked a little bit about kind of like the different ways of in which culture is shifting in which uh, people are now uh, kind of like really stepping up and uh, in, in really fantastic ways in which people are kind of like willing to tap into gray zones, uh, gray legal areas to save lives in which people are kind of like stepping up, uh, proposing legal defense funds for those, uh, you know, who are in those gray areas and saving lives for those people who are blowing the whistle. And then in the sense in which kind of like decentralized communities are coming together um, then a few technologies that may help us do that much uh, much better in the future, um, especially from uh, from crypto commerce. Um, and, but then also how many of those technologies uh, are currently being kind of like exploited um, by uh, more uh, totalitarian uh, forms of government, and and in all the ways in which kind of like you know um, let's say more predatory states are kind of like seeking the nooks and crannies uh, in which to expand their power into. Right. And so we, we usually tackle kind of like always the risks and opportunities in those areas. And I mean, then we uh, last week we focused more on the kind of global scale 
and in the ways in which currently, you know, we have a ton of people that are really, really good at sense making. We have a ton of people that are really good at modeling. Metaculous, FHI, they all came out with fantastic modeling efforts, but it just so happens that no one's really listening, right? We have really good prediction tools already. People are working on them, uh, but it still kind of feels that, uh, that, that they're not really uh, kind of like effectively informing action yet. But, you know, there are a few ways, like, you know, we talked about DAO democracy, about future keys and so on, uh, but, but they're just not really entering the mainstream discourse. So, uh, like, my main fear is that there are actually a lot of opportunities available, um, but a lot of those people, like, I think many of us that are thinking along those lines are just not being consulted. So, um, one, one kind of choice that many people here have is that either we build this kind of like parallel operating system and hope that we can eventually perform like a genetic takeover and take over the Simpson system that is clearly defunct, or uh, we can uh, try to try to reform, but uh, but it just it doesn't really seem like there's much opportunity to plug in right now. So those are, I guess, a few things uh, that we've been talking about. I could go on the laundry list, but then I think I would be just <laughs> running the salon. I definitely don't want to be doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Um, if we can't meet in person, can we uh, meet online? And are there unique opportunities to being able to meet online? If healthcare is fucked up, can we use it to reform healthcare writ large? If education gets totally disrupted, rather than have uh, you know just a generation that has major gaps in their education, can we reform education? I would, like a classic example right now is the food supply chain. Is we've Basically, by stopping travel to be, stop the movement of the virus, we also stop the movement of fertilizers and pesticides and key supply chain dynamics that have led to this massive culling of animals and throwing dairy away and tilling uh, food back into the soil. So we have basically excessive supply that can't get where it needs. So it's getting ruined while the demand hasn't actually gone down. It's just we can't route it. Uh, properly and the perishability and the um, thin margins are such that we're actually driving hunger at scale. So the food supply system for give or take 2 billion people just got fucked. And so then we're like, okay, well, having a supply chain that has that many steps of vulnerability and it isn't a good idea. So if we have to fix it right now, and we do, because otherwise um, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people don't go hungry peacefully. Right. So you start to get a movement from a uh, virus to broken supply chains, to hunger, to violence, to war escalation. So let's say we're looking at um, the fact that Nigeria has the largest food insecurity population and population density in the world, 26 million, give or take people without food security, and that their food system just got completely damaged. And what happened here? Plus their economy, because they're they're based on the price of oil, right? Like almost their entire economy is based on the price of oil, which just had this massive Saudi Arabia, Russia oil shock kind of thing. And you look at what that starts to look like in terms of both. So, you know, Boko Haram is increasing and local gangs are increasing and, um, and then insurgency movements. So do we start to see a massive exodus, Syria style from Nigeria? Well, after Syria and the damage that happened to the EU, where do those people go? Because the, the EU doesn't want to take them, right? And it's under such massive fracture pressures already after Brexit and after COVID that some places take them and others don't. What does that do kind of for fracture pressure? So so this is when you can start to see how like a cascade of events like this goes, where we take the damage to the food supply that's happened in India. India and Bangladesh are particularly interesting because of the population density multiplied by total population that is near food vulnerabilities. And so you start to get a damage to the food supply system there and the total number of people that can be affected is just unprecedented, right? It's just astronomical. And we were looking at this before COVID from climate change. So remember the year started off with Australia burning, right? And um, while there were a number of factors, there was environmental mismanagement that led to too much uh, downed would because they had prevented small fires and um, not dealt with the forestry well. And because groundwater had been used uh, up irresponsibly and whatever, there were a number of factors, but increased dryness and heat was one of the major factors. So then we start looking at climate change mediated, not just do we have a climate that takes 
out the ability for people to live as a whole, which we're not going to get, which is why CSER and FHI and whatever don't look at climate change that much, but they should when they factor cascade effects, which is, do you have a climate dynamic that leads to, like, for instance, this upcoming summer in India and Bangladesh are estimated to have 52 Celsius heat waves independent of COVID. Well, that is enough to actually destroy most of their staple crops. And so when you don't have food stores, meaningful enough food stores, and you destroy the staple crops and you have people that are right on the edge of basic needs being unmet, then what happens? So then do the people in like without groundwater and without food and 52 Celsius heat just die peacefully? Right. Or do they start to try to get access to the limited resources and then violence emerges over limited resources? So where do those violence lines cleave along? Well, they cleave along existing tension lines. So does that look like Hindu Muslim tension lines? Sure. And so then does that look like India Pakistan tension that starts to mount? And you, so you start to see the cascade that happens when you have s systemic fragility of this kind. So now we still have that upcoming set of heat waves to deal with in India on top of the fact that we already just had a unanticipated crop failure ahead of that. Okay, so now we're talking about how do we rebuild things. Does anybody want to rebuild this food supply system the way that it is? Like, no, it's the most fucking terrible thing you can imagine, right? Because if, if you're going to do factory farming, nobody wants that near them because it's gruesome, right? It's environmentally gruesome. It's ethically gruesome. It's like n nobody wants those jobs. They have to usually be, the jobs are largely run by um, immigrants who have no other option. Uh, and so if you're going to do gruesome factory farms and they have to be in the areas that will accept them, then you have to ship them to far distances. Then you also have to have a very fragile supply chain that can break from something like COVID. So let's say we want to make our supply chains less fragile, that also means we want to increase locality. If you want to increase locality, you have to have types of agriculture that people are okay seeing, which is actually really good, right? Because the ability to ship the horror somewhere else, right? The open pit mining or the mountaintop removal mining or the factory farm or the landfill, that we can ship the horror somewhere else where nobody has to see it, depend on lots of shipping and everybody thinks that life is pretty cool around here because we put all the ugly parts somewhere else. That is actually one of the things that drives systemic fragility. So if we start saying, well, how do we increase food security? Well, one aspect is, can we start increasing locality in food systems? Well, doing that will also require making food systems that are better for soil, better for animal welfare, better for the environment, better for human health, on and on, right? So, um, and better for preventing future zoonotic pandemics that occur in places where you have a bunch of sick animals in a, a tight environment. So. It's important to remember that right before China had, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 emerge, they had to kill a humongous percentage of all their pigs because of a swine flu that emerged because of terrible pork-based factory farming. And, um, and they had another major um, bird flu outbreak. India had a bird flu outbreak because factory farms are terrible and they shouldn't exist. So that's an example of something that just broke that we have to rebuild because the consequence of not rebuilding it is too destructive for the world and we need to rebuild it differently. Um, there's a bunch of other examples like this. So pretty much the way I see COVID is that it was just a large enough global issue to set off the cascade effects of systemic fragilities that would have been set off by something. And so now the major issues that we're looking at are we, you know, like, let's say we look at, so we just talked about food supply. Let's say we look at the economy. Well, we already had a situation where the percentage of global GDP that went to debt servicing was so high that the economy was fundamentally dead and broken, right? And we needed to restructure it in some deep way because you can't have that much of total GDP going to debt servicing. Well, as a result of COVID, GDP dropped everywhere and debt went way the fuck up. And we were already at an existential level of GDP to debt ratio. So it's like, okay, so what, do, how, what are the economic effects of trying to keep propping that system up? And if you play them out, they're terrible. What does it take to fix it? Can we actually redo global financial monetary policy, central banking policy? What is the biggest type of step we could actually make in this uh, place? Um, 
I think it's important to note, you know, you were mentioning something that might be able to decrease predatory uh, opportunism in, in certain places like with regard to education. I would say since COVID has been happening, predatory opportunism has increased more than I have ever seen it in any other time or that I can think of uh, in history. Because when the market gets more volatile, there's a lot more money to be made if you know how to make it. There's a lot more money to be lost. There's also a lot more money to be made because there's more movement occurring. So if you're the one that is at the top of the power law distribution of intelligence and ability to actuate, then you're going to do very well. And we saw that, right? We saw some people get stupidly rich during the Great Depression relative to everyone else and also get more total asymmetry of wealth as that most people are getting poor. So it's a, the volatility increases asymmetries. So um, when you look at all the private intelligence companies, that when people leave CIA and NSA and whatever, that's where they go to work with those capabilities, who contracts them? Who are their main customers? Well, it's financial institutions are the biggest customer. There's plenty of other ones, right? But hedge funds and private equity funds, and whatever. So um, in terms of who was getting briefings in December and then early January, this is why you saw senators selling stock in January regarding, oh, this is actually a big fucking deal and this is going to affect the world. Um, if I run a hedge fund and the market is near the top of what the market has ever been at and can't keep going like that forever. And I see that there's about to be a major set of hits. Even if I hypothetically have a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of access, and I could try to use that to get the CDC and the WHO to do the right thing to save a lot of lives, that's not my job. And it's not what my incentive is. My incentive is to say, fuck, this is the time to sell all my stocks at the top of the market. I'm going to get a rebuy them at the bottom of the market when they are radically decreased in price and consolidate the fuck out of the total power base. I'm also going to short the market on the entire way down. I'm going to start shorting airlines and whatever else it is. And because of asymmetric information, asymmetric intelligence, I'm going to know about um, oil shock issues and food shock issues and whatever to be able to know which commodities to short and which ones to put options on ahead of time. Then there were a lot of pools of capital like sovereign wealth funds and family offices that have big pools of liquid capital that could not be well deployed recently because we had negative interest rates on bonds. And so it's like, I can't just leave my money sitting somewhere and have it make money. And negative interest rates are because the market was so broken because so much of the money was going to debt servicing and the global wealth inequality was so much that you had to basically just keep pumping free money, which is what negative interest is, to keep the system from collapsing. And so, um, and you didn't have very high volatility. So now those huge pools of sovereign wealth and uh, you know liquid capital are like, awesome, we get to buy up infrastructure for pennies on the dime right? And consolidate power a lot. So the people who have most access to intelligence and actuation capacity have been busier than ever during this time, not um, relaxing, right? If you're, if you have less to do, you know that you are not at the power law distribution at the top of the power law distribution. Um, because those people are seeing this as a maximum opportunity space, but it's the opportunity to be able to say, Oh, you know, lots of volatility. And it's not just volatility in markets. It's also awesome. This is a great way to roll out the surveillance tech we were wanting to roll out to get all of that data for surveillance capitalism or to increase the power of states if that's our particular thing to do. So that's, and now people will go for it, right? Um, or we can at least force it through. Um, or uh, situations where people won't be able to tend to elections in the same way they would have previously been able to because of uh, health issues is a great time to try and uh, manipulate elections. So, or if I'm China and I'm trying to advance the Belt and Road Initiative and there were some sticky places that weren't moving through and it happens to be that I'm really the only manufacturer of PPE at decent scale in the world, the places that wouldn't sign the Belt and Road Initiative before will now if that's the, the only way that they get to not die of the plague is that we come help them out and also not die of poverty as their economy crashes. Or let's say that we're Russia wanting to get the Eastern Alliance Baltic state back and kind of weaken NATO forces in EU or so just kind of you can think about all the power players. They're all motivated to do the shit they were already doing. But where you during an equilibrial 
phase, it's much harder to change the total relative power. During a time where you break up the equilibrium, you can have much more radical changes of power coming out the other side. Like, you know, think about the U.S. coming out clearly the world leader of World War II, not going in that position, and Britain coming out radically downregulated. Everyone who is sophisticated in the game of power is seeing this as that type of thing. And uh, so I would say the fragility has set off, like we have increased, meaningfully increased risk of violence in the U.S. and in other developed areas at the social level of just how many people are um, are freaked out, right? Like they have very partial sense-making in a world dominated by narrative warfare and information warfare, so nobody feels like they can actually make real sense, so they just do tribalism stuff. And so they're – and it's tricky, right? So they see – I'm a right oriented person. I don't know particular people that have died, but I also live in a low population density area and everything on the news is totally suspect as um, fake news. And I'm afraid of the idea that, that, that corruption and conspiracy and whatever would be happening to control things. And I actually go down and look at my local hospital and there's nobody fucking there and it's empty. And I see a few other things of like empty hospitals. No, of course if you actually have a pandemic going on, you will try to stop elective processes. And so you will have doctors going out of business in empty hospitals while also having a real pandemic. But there's some sophistication and nuance to be able to make sense of that whole thing. And if I don't have it, the partial perspective is pretty compelling, right? So then I'm like, oh, fuck, they're trying to take our freedoms away. We founded this country based on the right to bear arms and you know stand up against our government. So that thing starts to happen, right? And, and then you see simultaneous to that black guy running get shot protest happens bunch of bunch of black people doing a protest carrying guns right and so you see the like oh there's lots of sides that are at meaningful tension with each other increasing the signaling of violence then we see the actual violence increasing in in certain areas riots that happened in london and whatever and then very meaningful stuff in places like nigeria and um then we see bigger things like I don't think most people pay enough attention, but when you look at um, General McChrystal coming out a few weeks ago saying, I'm going to be using advanced DARPA technology to counter the fake news that Trump is putting out, people should pay attention when a four star general who ran covert ops for the US military, whose job was to overthrow governments from the inside using tools of narrative warfare, talks about using advanced AI semantic capability developed by DARPA to go against the standing president. Like that should be a signal if people are paying attention. Oh, what the fuck? That is closer to civil war. I don't know what signals are closer, right? So you just start looking at all those types of things and you look at the increased tension and signaling regarding militarism between US and China and on and on. So uh, it, we could go by sector, whether we're talking about the financial sector, the economic sector, movements towards violence, grid security, and say the existing risks that were there just got accelerated by like a decade uh, in almost all areas. Yeah, I mean. Now, yeah. now the question is to come out the other side, not way, way, way worse requires dealing with all that, not just dealing with the virus, but dealing with the second and third order effects that have already kicked off. And if we don't deal with that, we will come out way, way worse. In order to deal with it, we have to do deep enough changes that we will say, hey, we don't want to redo food supply this way or monetary policy this way. And we could come out much better. But that requires that the people who are thinking about how to do it better have to be as effective at making shit happen at a global scale as the groups that are currently working on power consolidation. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, man, there are so many things. I like, I mean, one of the things just like, you know, I think echoing what, like uh, whiffing off a few of the things that, uh, that you mentioned, one of the things was like being the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Like I think in a previous podcast or something you mentioned, what, what if China was actually tying that, you know, kind of like to the, um, um, you know, uh, to the, um, to the condition of using their digital currency, right? Then like many of the kind of like digital currencies and like uh, of the promises of freedom that we're excited about of them previously would kind of like uh, fall to the wayside then, right? And I think the same is true when when you look at like, I mean, if, if I look on, 
if I think back of how the salon started and how kind of like optimistic I was that there's a ton of opportunities to do uh, an incredible amount of good. And we've been thinking about this and I think really, really smart people are on it and are thinking about it and are talking about it. But meanwhile, it, it, like if I actually look at what's happening in the world in the meantime, it seems like things are just slowly getting worse and worse a little bit, like on a very kind of like, you know, personal level, like I was out uh, in San Francisco a few days ago and like there were like uh, street car like car races on the street right like people with motorcycles with cars racing out like multiple people like peeing in the park the police totally overwhelmed like a, a police every every five meters wherever i went like people just like totally wasted everywhere on the street and i was like wow this is very different to like the types of worlds that we're thinking about on a daily basis in those uh, global salons so you know it's it's kind of like weird to see that delta between meanwhile like it's it's kind of painful to see like we are always thinking uh, um, in in ways in which uh, the system could, could be much better but like it, it does seem like we're not taking into account many of the kind of like just very real physical uh, uh, kind of like physical constraints that are like uh, that, that, that are kind of currently making people move right and I feel like the same is true like on you know if we think about it on a global scale in terms of and what, what may happen with oil like one of the things that we, we've been talking about is like on the one hand it's uh, it's it's somewhat great that all futures are negative because for once we may be able to make the move to like renewable en energy but on the other hand also totally fucking terrifying right um because that may uh, mean like uh, much much more likely uh, that, that we enter into a, like violent conflict between different powers and especially with the u.s currently realizing that it really doesn't have a shit uh, in in order on a, on a global scale right like we've never seen kind of like uh, nations uh, kind of like um, in, in international order moving peacefully or like switching peacefully right so it's like it just seems like it's a total weird cognitive dissonance by which you can dream up those really amazing changes that could be occurring meanwhile things are moving really quickly in all sorts of directions um in really complicated ways with not only second order effects but like that's why i mentioned the currency like the you know potentially chinese uh, kind of like um, maybe uh, ordering something like you know their digital currency if they uh, ever kind of like enforce something like the belt and road on on many others that's not a second order that's almost like a third order effect so I my question so it's a long winded way of saying there's it, there seems to be a ton of opportunity there seems to be a ton of risk it seems like we're really smart people together often and, and I'm also speaking about your circles that are thinking really well about this and you just mentioned how uh, intelligent people within the system are gaining. Uh, could make a ton of money uh, by gaming the system with the information that they have. So what is kind of like the kinds of information that we could be using um, and the kinds of kind of like comparative advantage that we may have uh, in, in, in putting that to the table to kind of create the better worlds and not the worst ones of those? Something I was personally really impressed with, um, and I don't mean impressed in a good way, just impressed upon me, when I first started encountering the halls of power in the world more so top of government and of finance and like that is how few people there were actually really good thinkers um they were smart enough to understand how to execute certain types of things not particularly creative not particularly systemic not particularly critical but like just basically smart enough, they were mostly ambitious, like super fucking ambitious and super hardworking and slanted heavily in the cluster B direction. Um, cluster B meaning DSM-5 uh, personality disorders, specifically the power seeking ones that are willing, because like if you don't have something psychologically wrong with you, for the most part, those are really miserable lives to be continuously engaging with people that are trying to fuck you over and stab you in the back and lie to you so that you can just get more power that doesn't equate to meaningful quality of life and have no real relationships because the only people that are interacting with you want something from you. Like you, there has to be something mostly psychologically wrong with you to want to gain a lot of power. So the psychological dispositions that are power seeking, we call it sociopathy, uh, psychopathy, narcissism, tend to be willing to put up with the difficulties and do the fucked up things necessary to win a lot of win lose games and get to the top of the power law distribution of power systems. 
And sometimes you actually need to not have complex thought so that you can avoid looking at the externalities you're causing and that you can give plausible deniability even to yourself. Um, and to, to be able to just execute on some simple things, which is usually where more power comes from. So then I see people who care more and have more complex thinking not want to do things that will cause lots of externalities and think about what the quality of life in their short period of time being alive is and not necessarily want to be engaged in those types of financial warfare and political warfare and whatever all the time. And so they just don't ever get much power, which also means they don't influence things very much. So basically there is a disposition. There is a systemic disposition that makes sociopaths and their like mostly run the world. And until we actually fix that, we are just on a, a movement towards self-induced termination. Well, I mean, I mean, there is this argument of like, you know, why the worst rise to the top and, and, and all of like all of those arguments that, that I think are usually really, um, you know, arguments against the consolidation of, of power. Right. And I think that you've uh, in previous podcasts and on your writing pointed to a lot of kind of like systems that are kind of like currently being built in the crypto commerce space in which at least you could have better sense making tools that uh, would make that would make those kind of tendencies much harder um but you know i wonder whether you know you're proposing that like should we reform or should we exit and build new i want to speak orthogonal to that question uh first just addressing that question i would say there's there's roughly three horizons of focus that I pay attention to. I pay attention to like immediate triage, which isn't trying to reform the current systems and it isn't trying to build new ones. It's just trying to keep some terrible shit from happening that we can't fix afterwards. And so like, how do we prevent massive death in India right now and massive escalation of violence we're not even we're, we're not going to fix capitalism or fix corruption or fix the current indian government to do that it's like can we can we do the right things with supply chains and aid and shit to be able to prevent because there are some issues that you can prevent but you can't fix them after they've happened they they are irreversibly destructive and so one of the things I'm very focused on is the kind of sense making that shows us the escalation pathways to various types of irreversible catastrophic risk so that we can identify the most targeted interventions to stop those things from happening. So that's actually neither fixing the current systems nor making better ones, right? That's just keep the patient from bleeding out. Um, then there is how do we work with the current institutions to make them better because we're not going to have post-capitalist, post-nation state, post-democratic societies running the world in the next few years. We're just There's no fucking way that's going to happen. And it's not even going to happen in a generation. Their generational shift has to occur for the up-leveling of systemic sense-making and for good systems that start to happen somewhere to get through the resistance necessary to be the primary operating system. So that means that the you know, 50 to $100 trillion that trades hands every day that is that much collective human incentive and human behavior is going to keep running through the systems it's running through for a while. So we have to take those systems and make them less terrible. I'm not even going to say more good, just less terrible. Um, and that's kind of the second horizon of focus is um, institutional repair. How do we take... and most of the institutions we currently have were better when they were created and then they decayed because predatory opportunism kind of decayed them. And that's actually, if you, you know, Samo probably spoke about that when he was on here, Michael Vassar might have the theory of institutional decay, civilizational decay. So if we look at the way that the American Republic was initially intended, it would, it's, it's not a perfect form of governance. And it of course doesn't, address how to deal with a decentralized exponential tech world and, and Facebook. Like it doesn't, they, they weren't thinking about those issues. So we need something better than that, but it's so many thousands of times better than the shit we have right now. That is basically like a maximally corrupt kleptocracy pretending to be a Republic. Um, and not even pretending all that much because it doesn't matter what people think because they don't do anything. Um, which was very clear in things like the Epstein case or even COVID right now. But Epstein case was very interesting to me because that marked the hallmark in my witnessing in the U.S. where 
some people still believed in the news to where nobody actually believed in the news if they were paying attention. Because when Epstein died, all of the major publications, whether they were believed to be right-leaning or left-leaning, if they're major publications, continuously and only said when Epstein commits suicide in prison. And I just don't know anyone that actually thinks that he, he commits suicide in prison. Um, and so what that meant was everyone said, hmm, what, what the fuck is that? If the left and the right leaning and supposedly owned by different people and different organizations, and they're all saying something that nobody believes, and then but still nobody does shit about it because nobody thinks they can do anything about it. And they're all on benzos and opiates and porn and Facebook. So um, th they're kind of too weakened and addicted to do anything anyways. Um, plus, if you think about trying to go do something about it, you're like, okay, don't revolutions require violence? The SWAT team has tanks. Like, what the fuck do we do against tanks? So how do you deal with these things when it seems like there things are actually relatively comfortable? And no matter how upset I get, by the time I've scrolled Facebook for five minutes, I forgot, right? Like the hypernormal stimulus is strong enough that I forgot. And the seeming chance of succeeding at something seems so hard that people just, it, it doesn't really matter. So we don't even have to pretend that there is a republic that much anymore. Um, on the Epstein thing, it's important to just kind of say here, people who paid attention there said, okay, wait. <clears throat> so Mueller said, when he was trying him the first time, said publicly, uh, I was told to shut this case down that he's a Epstein is a U.S. intelligence asset that's above my pay grade. Okay. And then we find out the things Epstein was involved in. And, we, and then we hear the names that would be part of the court investigation if it went the next day, which involves presidents on both the Republican and Democrat side, let, lots of other people say. So this is the most important court case in the history of the U.S. where multiple presidents – uh, on both sides and, you know, people of all kinds of power are possibly going to be um, indicted for like some of the worst crimes people can think about. And the dude dies in jail on suicide watch and the cameras go off and everything the day before. And we're like, okay, wait, does that mean that the, there isn't really a justice system and the, there isn't really a police system as a part of a justice system and there isn't really news and the intelligence agencies are part of are involved in things that involve like child sex trafficking. Anyone who's paying attention had all those thoughts and then just started doing other shit again. Um, so the topic that comes up for me here is what does it take to think about better systems and solutions, but then what does it take to go implement them and to be as effective at implementing as, okay, if I want to protect the rainforest in South America, I have to be more effective than the multinationals and the national interests behind trying to cut the rainforest down, which is the CCP, major Chinese multinationals, European multinationals, some Kremlin forces, some super corrupt politicians doing all those types of things. We're, we lose the fucking Amazon if it continues to be some very incompetent NGOs against those forces. So if you want to actually keep it, you actually have to be able to out influence them. And that's one of the things that I'm really wanting to see is typically people only start to engage in the game of influence, which is also the game of power, if they are oriented towards power seeking in ways that make them not good stewards of power. And the world is fucked from this. For people who are trustworthy who could be good stewards of power, or groups who could be, they will not for their own intrinsic reasons be oriented to want to do that. But the ones who could for the collective good be willing to step up into that shitty life of engaging in the game of power because it's actually good for the whole. That is one of the critical things that is needed for the world to make it right now. And that's neither new systems Oh, so I went off. That's neither like there's triage work, there's fix the existing systems, there's make new better systems, but all of them require being able to move stuff effectively at a global scale. Yeah, I think uh, one thing, you know, like one thing about the sense making apparent is like, if you like an elephant uh, in the brain, Robin Henson kind of points out to why 
uh, kind of like his work on predictions, why he thinks that it has never been picked up. And it's basically like people don't want to know uh, what, what's going to happen because that means that people could have predicted wrong, which means you can hold people accountable for having predicted wrong and for having made wrong decisions. And people don't really want that. They just want to kind of collectively trick themselves and signal to each other that they're trying to do the best. But meanwhile, no one actually really cares whether anything kind of like uh, whether anything gets done. And like, and I do worry, you know, that even if we had really good sense making. Uh, apparatus is like you know metabolism and a few other tools are already out there that are really quite fantastic but they seem to not be coupled to actuators right and and you could say well either we kind of like wake up the establishment to that they should be using something like a future key uh, a future key um a future key governance system or we try to kind of like do better ourselves which you know then again comes to the point of like who's willing to step up within our communities to kind of like <laughs> take the leap forward and do that uh you know and and and, and i think actually meanwhile i mean you know, it just I think it came out today or yesterday or something, right? Like uh, Twitter and Facebook just like now cooperating with the uh, CDC and with the WHO or something to uh, to try to make sense of like fake news posts um, about uh, about COVID nineteen, which then tricks people uh, in having less and less trust in any type of sense making apparatus anymore. That's kind of like vaguely in the mainstream, right? And and people just getting more and more down the conspiracy alley because you know, as you said, with in the Epstein case, like. It doesn't really seem like anyone can be trusted anymore if the WHO and, and other like you know organs are telling you like one day like don't wear masks, the next day totally wear masks. And like it's it's all super confusing. It's really, really hard to kind of like figure out who to trust. But I do actually think that this community has this intrinsic benefit of like being able to have have called the shots really, really early. Um and so you know, I, I just want to kind of like maybe uh, poke you a little bit more on that, you know, what would it you were already saying, well. It is almost a property of those people who should step up to do something that they inherently don't want to, <laughs> um, and uh, and and that those who want to may not be the right people <laughs> who should who should do it. So, uh, how do you incentivize those people, uh, if at all, or like you know, what are specific kind of like projects that you think uh, could require a leader right now? Who do you think uh, would be good people to take something on? Like you know, if you're talking quite locally and quite actionable, like what what would you? like people and this community focus on more uh, and then you know maybe we can outsource it amongst ourselves uh, and, and take it on i would be very enheartened if the rationalist community and ea community started to use words like sacred and devotion more and not as a kind of it intellectually makes sense that there is a thing that we can define this way semantically and or it's a signally kind of thing but from having experiences of and i i don't mean to define them in some kind of pre-rational religious way but sacred what is most precious what is most meaningful to me and what is meaningful to me more than my own experience in my own life and why is my own experience in my own life even meaningful and what does that tell me about the value of life and experience as a whole and then in light of that what am i what is my devotion to and to not just what has the best utility function um they move in different parts of us and you have to do both if you read the Tao Te Ching as a book of leadership, it basically says in many different ways, the person who really wants to lead, everybody should run away from because there's something wrong with that guy. Um, and they're probably basically psychologically a child. And the person who really, really doesn't want to lead and everyone pushes into the position because everyone trusts them from how they show up as long as that person doesn't start to identify with the role too much, they can probably do an all right job. Um, but you asked, how do we kind of push people there? I would say if people meditate on what is actually sacred to you, what do you want your life to be in service to? What do you really understand is going on in the world right now? And let that be more of what has your attention than your to-do list or your Facebook feed then there'll start to be a sense of what you can't not do. And it's not just for, you know, personal disposition, but what the greater collective need and what's meaningful calls you to. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the rationalists, and I've never been there, but have the secular solstice, for example, right? And uh, and I do think that that kind of like feeling is something that I want to tap into with existential hope. Like, as I created this website with like positive visions for humanity and like, it's more like a philosophy um, kind of like um, blog really that I think, because if you, if you talk to many people that have done incredible things, they have done them because they've read very early, very inspiring uh, stuff that never, that they could never forget about. Right. Like it, it came from this like total uh, kind of like, internal uh, admiration for this incredible future that, that that they could see or for this you know really like an incredible kind of like almost like aesthetic flow state uh, or something that that w came from an intrinsically positive uh, place and i think that's an incredibly um kind of like a uh, stable uh, motivator right that it, it doesn't it, you know it like it doesn't make you uh, it doesn't make you stop very, very 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 quickly right and so i think having that and having that in community i think is uh, is, is a really motivating for us. I, I would kind of like, I, I worry a little about, you know, like electing like the, the global leader. I think, you know, one thing that uh, we also often tend to talk about in this communities is like, well, it took us a really long time in history to uh, kind of like stop asking who should be in power, but to start asking more like, you know, what kinds of architect decision architectures can we create uh, kind of like which empower more people, right? So even there, I think, you know, this kind of like, um, tendency of electing, you know, the, the right person, uh, you know, maybe we can, uh, we can do a little better than that uh, and if we get the right architectures in place. And I'm, I'm curious whether, you know, you could point to a few specific kind of like, I guess, like cooperation architectures or um, ways in which you think people are already cooperating well that uh, we could model off. It seems to me that you, Allison, are personally working your ass off to make these videos available to everyone, that you're personally taking a bunch of leadership initiative during this time to make a more beautiful future that you feel inspired to do and that you care about. And everybody's wouldn't be here if you weren't doing that. And everyone is appreciating it and they're not all taking equal leadership and making it happen. Don't get confused that decision architectures to come about still don't take people taking leadership action to make them happen. Like who the fuck figures out the decision architectures, who implements them, who gets people involved. That's always in, like inspiration on the behalf of some people that makes those things happen. So don't underweight that. Um, that is that can be a bridge to people saying, I'm going to take leadership not to hold leadership forever. I'm going to try and take some leadership to create things that help everyone be able to participate in leadership in more democratized and better ways. And that is the healthy right kind of leadership. The right kind of leadership is I will use some asymmetric influence or power in a way that tries to increase everyone else's access to be able to do that as well, rather than to continue to increase my own asymmetry of power over everyone else. That's what I would call legitimate versus illegitimate power. And so what I'm proposing is that legitimate power has a necessary function in moving us to a post illegitimate power dynamic world. All right, <laughs> taking that and um, kind of acting on it by unmuting a participant who has a question. <laughs> Max, uh, you had a question. I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, Daniel. Nice. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, are you going to relaunch the Americans Project? And if so, please, or if not, please could you present uh, the main thesis, thesis slash aims for members of the Hive that are unfamiliar with it? Thanks. The Emergence Project was a name of some kind of research and aspirations I was engaged in like a decade ago, which is just part of this ongoing thread for me of how to understand the nature of the problems in a way that gives rise to better solutions and implement them. That was a, per that was a particular point in time with a particular set of collaborators and um, the work, the insights advanced a lot since then. Um, so I wouldn't say relaunch that. I would say that was a step in a lot of steps. For me, there were, you know, like I started with activism young and there were certain problems I really cared about. And then I saw that the projects working on solving those problems just moved the problems and caused other problems. And, you know, like I very personally saw that, like we worked to get fences around a 
preserve for elephants in Africa, but it didn't address the underlying poverty and basis of why they were poachers. So the poachers started moving to hunt the mountain gorilla and the white rhino, both of which were more endangered. And I'm like, fuck, we just worked super hard to make the world worse because we just had more endangered animals get poached. And then I started looking at all the places where that happens. I'm like, it's pretty much everything. Cause we, we define the problems too narrowly. And so our solution to a narrowly defined problem ends up externalizing harm in other areas. So I started looking at more and more of the problems, how they interconnected, and then are there underlying generators that give rise to them? And then also, how are they, are there things that are getting worse, which got me into catastrophic and existential risk. And then I'm like, man, there's so many fucking catastrophic risks. If we solve the top 10, we'd only buy like 10 years because there's thousands of them. They're all driven by the same generator function. So we can't just deal with them all kind of as instances, we have to deal with the whole class. So that led me to thinking about why do humans use, why, what is it about human architecture, human behavioral architectures that has us keep developing more power and using it badly? And what would it take to be able to not have us be bad stewards of power, technological power? Um, using it badly on purpose, warfare and rivalry and whatever, or using it badly, not on purpose, meaning just externalities, but, you know, they have cumulative effects in that scale. So that gave rise to this kind of generator functions of existential risk work. And then thinking about, are there categorical solutions to those generator functions that make a new civilization model, the kernel of a new civilization? And that was a bunch of years of work to kind of figure out what are there, an, can we define a necessary and sufficient set of design criteria for a civilization that can have exponential tech and not self-terminate? And we came up in that research that the answer is yes, that there is actually architectures that are possible. There, it doesn't mean we'll get there. They're hard, but there are possible things. So then there was, how do we work on building that? And then also the next step was, well, that's going to take generations and we don't get there currently if we don't do a whole bunch of the, you know, triage work and working to change the current institution. So what kind of both intelligence and influence needs to happen? So that's kind of the progression of interests and projects and emergence project was one kind of step in that inquiry. I just shared a uh, civilization emerging, uh, which uh, I got at least uh, quite a lot of work from you from. Uh, I'm hoping that is one of the, like another, uh, let's say later stage in that in your projection. And uh, maybe, I mean, it's now 7 p.m. Uh, so what we usually do is like people, whoever wants to stay on, stay on. Uh, but now I always want to give kind of like panelists like an easy way to bow out <laughs> and be mindful of your, of, of your time. Um, maybe, um, I mean, you're super welcome to stay on. I'm sure that there's a ton of questions, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe uh, as the final words or as words to lead on to uh, into a uh, next discussion, kind of like what are kind of like things that are currently on your mind? Um, what are kind of like uh, next things that you will be focusing your attention on tomorrow and the days after? And just for context, if people go there, Civilization Emerging was a blog I put up a few years ago, <clears throat> put a few articles on, and then haven't put anything on in, in several years. And there's like a new economic series, part one, two, three, four. It was supposed to be an eight-part series. So I described several parts of what's wrong with economics and then never get around to finishing explaining what to do with it because there was other stuff that became a higher priority. Um, <clears throat> there's maybe still some value in some of it. Most of the stuff that I've been focused on doesn't have a particular public face because <clears throat> not all projects benefit from a lot of attention. Um, but there is a project that I'm working to uh, get over the line that will have a public face and that I would be very interested in this community's feedback on and participation with, which is a... Uh, basically a site that will be trying to help correct the information ecology in the epistemic commons by doing both uh, being able to vet the information space for the information that has highest confident intervals and most uh, significance and being able to share that in the right form. So kind of not news, but meta news but then also being able to show the epistemic process by which we come to that. So people don't just get better information to do sense making, but better information processing capabilities. 
So sometime in the next month or so, a uh, beta version of that should be up, and I look forward to uh, hear people's thoughts on it. Very cool. Yesterday we had two models out here, uh, one on Infinity Project, which is like a kind of like way in which we could model the whole economy, and then the other one by Jamie Joyce, who's on here on uh, COVID-19 uh, argument chains from COVID Convo. I don't know if you, uh, if you guys have connected, but maybe that, that would be useful, a point to touch base on as well. Um, okay, I want to get that uh, recently. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, super. Well, I want to give you the chance to uh, kind of like to gracefully bow out here. And meanwhile, you're also very, very welcome to stay on. Uh, I'm sure we I'm have. Happy uh, to, I'm happy to hop off if people like to talk about things uh, when the speaker leaves, but I'm also happy to stay and answer questions if that's desired. Well, we'll okay. happily take you. <laughs> okay, next one up, we had Diego. Diego, I'm going to mute you. You had a bunch of questions, and I think the last one that you posted here looked look quite good. Um, I'm going to mute you now. All right, so uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm a big fan of all the stuff that you've done, and I've been amazed by your videos and thoughts and so on, um, Daniel. But second, uh, my question is, Historically, the entities that became civilization-like uh, and became super organisms, they're religions. And I'm curious if you have any ideas of how to create anti-rivals or game-ish religion-like structures and what advantages and disadvantages there are in kind of co-opting or hijacking the religious aspect of the brain in order to, you know, steer a, a burgeoning civilization in that way. Yeah. Um... It's actually really worth studying the religions that had an, some meaningful endurance and were less directly violent. So studying the Quakers, studying the uh, Jews, like there's some very interesting things regarding how those collective intelligence systems worked. Um, Jews specifically being a diaspora, not having a physical location to um, defend or to be able to rest upon, had to create this kind of decentralized collective intelligence system to have synchrony while being in embedding cultures. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a bunch of interesting things to study there. And of course, we can look at the Jains and the Buddhists and groups that historically had nonviolence as higher um, principles. And you see that like Tibet can stay safe for a pretty long time until it actually becomes a risk. And then it gets taken over by a militaristic force pretty easily, right? And so one of the tricky things has been, and, and this is like when you look at, one of the things that blows my mind is looking at the history of Christianity um, and saying, Okay, so when we look at the Inquisition or the witch trials or the Crusades or any of the things that said they were in Jesus's name, and then you look at the Gospels of Jesus saying, let he who has no sin cast the first stone, like how the fuck did people figure out that piece of mental gymnastics to do that thing, right? Um, so you start to see an evolution and you can see like the Essenes went Jane direction with Christian kind of ideas. And then the Crusades went a different direction. So it's almost like you, the religion is like a mimetic complex and it can undergo mutation. And some of those will have it propagate more and defend itself against external forces more. Typically, those are the ones that move it in the direction of um, effective violence. Not always, often. So one of the big questions becomes... How does a peaceful culture stay peaceful while not being overtaken by warring cultures, mimetically, economically, or militarily? Because if the warring culture is willing to initiate that thing and the peaceful culture loses by default, then that doesn't work. Um, but if the peaceful culture to be able to defend itself against a militarized culture has to reallocate all of its attention to being better at, at warfare than the militarized culture, it's not a peaceful culture anymore. So there is... That's a question I spent a lot of time with. And there are some very interesting insights on that, but that's like a whole, that would take another conversation. Right, J just to mention one thing. Um, I mean, the examples you cited, they're somewhat isolated biogeographically. So I'm curious if, you know, are there less 
uh, violent militaristic uh, examples or, or at least an idea of how to structure a system that isn't that isolated and still doesn't involve the militaristic ethos. This is why I mentioned the Jews. And uh, then also even the Quakers, when they were, say, embedded within dominant Protestant and other religions here in the U.S. So you have ones that were not, which is different than the Amish who stayed isolated. Ones that stay isolated is one thing, but ones that will be embedded within a dominant culture and interact with that dominant culture and even get positions in the halls of power while being able to maintain fealty to their um, relationships is that's actually a very interesting study. And I will say that none of them I believe are quite adequate. You could take the Masons as another example, right? Um, Which are quite interesting similarly. Uh, And I mean the Masons mostly after the U S was formed. Um, so geographic isolation is obviously one factor. Uh, so what religion we could create on the Mars base is one whole kind of question, but the ones that geographic proximity is one question, which is what types of rituals require physical embodiment and the people to be able to share in that way versus physical isolation, which is which ones require not being infiltrated by other memes and other people. Yeah. All right. Obviously, that didn't really answer the question. It just expanded on the question. And it's a really interesting topic. And we would need some more time. Yeah, I also uh, I I quite like uh, Bert Weinstein's uh, thoughts on uh, on like on the evolution of uh, of religions. And I think uh, it's a I I remember um, I forgot who that was with uh, with Tyler Altman when we talked about how can we create a renaissance from uh, from the current uh, from, from COVID-19, you know, we're kind of like going through a few of the kind of like factors that make religions great. And we're trying to kind of like see whether you can kind of like almost uh, kind of like modulate a movement according to those. But the problem is that, you know, like they're really, really hard to kind of like fake, you know, <laughs> like many of the things that make them work are kind of like, because we've intrinsically uh, kind of like intrinsically buy into them. It's really hard to engineer a movement that has the same properties as a working religion, I think. Um, well, like even the phrasing of, can we, utilize or hijack that set of dispositions in the brain for some useful purpose isn't what gives rise to the experience that people have devotion to, right? Like there is an actual experience of belonging and experience of aspiration to ethics and numinous experience that is an actual transcendental operator as opposed to simply an omniscient operator thinking about a transcendental operator. Um, so it's a, it's a different thing Someone doesn't have to have sloppy metaphysics to be able to understand phenomenology. Um, right, but you can also design it, right? Like Muhammad probably was less Muslim than whoever came four generations later because they were raised in it from early on. So their phenomenology is more entangled with the system than whoever designed the system and wrote the the Quran. So we could be the designers, if not the faithful. I think it's very interesting to explore religions that emerged from authentic depth of insight and experience that weren't seeking to be religions. And yet the depth of experience and insight about the human condition was meaningful enough and compelling enough that it had some organic growth versus ones that were intended to gain power oftentimes for political purposes and that were thinking about how to hijack different kinds of group think and belonging and superstition and the different dispositions that those things will take i think is also another very interesting inquiry all right thank you we're going to give a few and like the chance for a few other participants to ask a question Saf had another question Saf, i'll meet you Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, um, so I was just wondering, um, so Daniel talks a lot about how you should uh, think about the problem in depth to make sure that you don't, by implementing solution, you don't cause other externalities. Um, is there is there like a, like a balance to be had between, uh, between how much time you spend uh, thinking about a problem versus implementing? Because for example, you can spend your whole life thinking about something to try to implement a perfect solution to it, but then in the end, you won't be as, as, as effective 
as uh, if you maybe implement a par partial solution, then kind of figure things out along the way. Yeah. So sometimes the only way to actually figure out what the externalities are is to start to experiment or to figure out how it works is to start to experiment. And, but the key is, do, do I need to do safe to fail probes and safe to fail um, type experimental environments? And it's going to depend upon the degree of consequentiality. So it's like, what is the externality consequence of this thing? And what type of I'll tell you how I think about it. It's what is the complexity in terms of like total number, order of magnitude of interactions of the situation we're trying to interact with. So let's say I'm looking at doing some biotech thing in humans. There's going to be a lot more total complexity of biological interactions that can occur than if I'm trying to change something in a computer chip. And so I think about how many, how many orders of magnitude of interactions are here and what how many orders of magnitude have i considered so that's one thing i'll think about is the the phase space of likely interactions relative to what i've thought about and if that's even within rough powers of 10 i'm at least thinking about it then i think about as best i can what are the consequences at least that are in the second order and maybe some bit of the third order set that i can think about and the more consequential those are also the better we want to have thought about it and the more we want to roll it out in a progressive process so if i'm thinking about oh i just created some um self-replicating synthetic biology let's release it in the backyard and see what happens that's a dumb idea right because the i i'm I don't know what the externalities are going to be. And it could be that I just released gray, green goo and it kills everything. Um, do I release it in a certain kind of uh, BSL-4 laboratory environment to be able to witness what's happening, right? Like that would be the, the, let's actually find out what it does because we can't just think about it. We have to experiment and get into the medium itself. Now, if I'm looking at a hybridized crop where I just bred a couple crops together, the total amount of genetic change on that compared to a genetically modified crop versus synthetic biology are going to have me want to do different degrees of safety analysis. So like when I think about with COVID and uh, drugs that could help, if we take a drug that's been around for a really long time, like hydroxychloroquine or methylene blue or ivermectin or whatever drugs that we've had for 50 or 70 years and used in millions of people and have a huge amount of long-term safety data on. And now I'm just looking at, are they effective? I'm doing efficacy studies. I might be willing to expedite to speed up that research more than a new drug that we don't have long-term safety data on because I might say, oh, well, it didn't cause any major consequences in the two months I did the trial, but it's because it's, but it might be causing consequences that have delayed biological reactions to show up a year or two years later. So if I already have long-term data on safety, I can do faster stuff on efficacy. So I'm much more willing as from a policy perspective to expedite FDA authorization on long-term existing drugs than new ones. And I'm also more willing to expedite drugs than vaccines because the, like a small molecule drug isn't intended to have an enduring effect. Whereas a vaccine is actually intended to modulate the Th1, Th2 systems for years or decades or permanently. And so long-term safety studies are actually more important and something that I'm anticipating will have a longer term effect. So that's an example of like, based on how much we already know that's adjacent and what basis for concern about risk is there, what degree of appropriate research would need to come in place. Um, I think that brings me back to like one question that I think we uh, were almost nearing to at the, at the beginning of this, which is, you know, given the kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, incredible uh, really failure of response uh, that we've seen, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the US, um, you know, can we, how, how, how do you best make sense of that? Do you think that is uh, just pain and competence or do you think that there's kind of like some, uh, some something more under the hood that many of us, uh, you know, like maybe don't, don't like to see it? Do I think that 
everyone who is in a position of a th- influence has maximally good motives and that any lack of effectiveness is simply a result of incompetence. I think that's just silly when you frame it that way. Right? <clears throat> Do I think that every major politician and different countries that are warring over power grabs and uh, everyone working in who would benefit from surveillance tech and who would benefit from a collapse of the economy? Do I think that all the people who have major influence and could influence institutional response really just want to save all the lives they can, make everything as good as they can, keep the market from crashing and you know keep all the jobs intact? And the only reason we didn't do a better job is just incompetence. I think that's just silly. I think that we have people who are in positions <clears throat> supposedly on behalf of some larger thing, but there is a conflict of interest where it's actually on behalf of whatever their personal interests are, and they're advancing those agendas. Now, does that mean there is one coordinated cabal conspiracy at the top? No. It means that there is a decentralized set of opportunistic power grab incentives combined with having to do enough towards the thing they're supposed to do that they don't get kicked out of their position. And do I think that there's an even distribution on how sociopathic everyone is? No, there's, a, there's a, probably a Gaussian distribution on that. Um, but no, I think saying that, you know, obviously very few people needed to die from COVID had we been paying attention in December and early January and doing effective responses and we didn't need to fuck the whole economy and the food supply chains didn't need to get damaged. Um, did all those things happen just because all of the nation states are super bureaucratic and, and um, the decision-making processes are slow? No, that's not the only reason. All right, thanks. Uh, I don't know whether you read by, uh, Robin Hansen came out with this post a while ago on group A and group B alliances globally and um, basically making a point that um, after this, the kind of like economic world order will be largely defined by those people that, or by those countries that have got their shit together and can trade, uh, like among, you know, and those more. And um, I think like you even see that between houses. So uh, currently, like uh, All right. I'm back. You're back. <laughs> we we didn't hear most yeah, anything yeah. that you said. Oh, Wi-Fi is bad. Okay, that's fine. Well, I was just going to say there's a, a really interesting article by Robin Hansen where he's basically talking about Group A and Group B alliances, and they're currently like uh, on a geopolitical scale. This is kind of shifting in the sense where um, many countries that were previously Group um, A alliance or, or or countries that were kind of like more higher up in the kind of like geopolitical order are kind of like moving down because they're not really not getting their, their act together uh, and the u.s may also move into uh into a group b alliance by which it may not be safe enough to be in kind of like, let's say the group a alliance which can have flow of labor and flow of goods amongst themselves and if that so happens and i see that kind of like on a on a local level where you know if you have different parts of people that all have different safety standards and some of them are uh, keeping their shit together and it's working really well um you know uh, that trance isn't transitive in the in the sense that um you know you you um you there there are certain performing and they're not all kind of like interacting well together and um i'm wondering on on a global level if if the same holds true in the sense that there will be kind of like which you know will trade more with each other and in which perhaps like a lot of uh, employers will move and and will kind of like entice their employees to move into and that won't be the same parts in which they have previously been living right what that may mean on a geopolitical level 
Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of alliance shifting already, right? We see um, the Italy's curve finally starting to flatten was when China came in and gave it a bunch of aid, which included surveillance drones and other things. So, um, <clears throat> and you see EU and EU adjacent countries thinking the EU would support them and didn't, and then getting Chinese support or a few cases, some other types of support. So massive alliance shifting. We see even within the U.S. the groups of states that are clustering. So the the California, Oregon, Washington complex, and the the seven state complex around New York. And um, I really feel that the U.S. getting its shit together and being able to help lead alliance efforts is pretty critical and will make a big difference to the way the world plays out. And because even though I can't say the U.S. is actually a republic. It at least it at least has that vague idea of having some values or ideals around a republic, around democracy. Whereas when we look at China and we look at Russia and we look at Saudi Arabia and we look at Iran and most of the other power players, they don't even this like autocracy is really fully embraced. And I don't think um, exponential tech empowered autocracy is a world we want to go towards. And I think that if those are the players that are offering aid to the rest of the world and the U.S. isn't because the U.S. is so internally fighting over its own power because it has – and this is how big empires die, right? And democracies make it two to 300 years and we're almost at 250 years. Um, there's so much power here that you have so much internal infighting to see who gets that power that you just kind of lose awareness on what's actually happening in the world and that you're losing relative position to it. And it's not that I want the U.S.'s position relative to the world to be something in particular, but I think that its ability to help participate with alliance efforts for the values of roughly democratic type Western civilization values um, having a place I think is super important. And it's one of the things that I most want to see people engaged in is um, efforts that decrease internal bipartisan warfare and create more uh, more effective national governance that can then do international alliance building better. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two more questions from uh, Luke Nosek and from Yosha Bach. Luke, I'm going to meet you. So, so Daniel, um, you had uh, you had said I'm not sure if I misheard you. I think it's becoming a little more clear with your more, more recent uh, comments. Something about um, empowering people or uh, or distributing power, um, and uh, and then you recently alluded to republic or democracy and these things being good. Um, can you be more specific about what the, the, the problem is with power and uh, who uh, should, you know, who should actually organize it so that we could do things effectively like do international treaties? Because it, it doesn't seem like, you know, warring parties in a democracy is a, a sensible way of doing it. That's very obvious. But what do you specifically believe about um, how to organize power, who should have it, and so that uh, you could effectively run the world and have uh, good things happen. Uh, big question. Um, it could go in a bunch of directions. Do you mean like, do I think uh, moving towards a positive global singleton is what we should aim for? Or is there some kind of future of democracy that we should aim for? Or like, how do we make America better currently? Um, and obviously, when we talk about power, there's power in the markets, which is achieved a certain way, power in the state, power in religion and culture. Um, yeah, I, I would like to be able to address where the question, what, what you're interested in better. Can't hear you currently. I think, Allison, you have to unmute him. I'm muted. You're unmuted for half a second. I'm muted. There we there go. go. There you go. Okay. I'd like you to be as idealistic as possible. So none of this triage, you know, or incrementalism stuff. Just, um, or what do you think is possible uh, for uh, 
uh, for humans uh, in, an, in an ideal state. I'm got, trying to get a sense of what, you know, what your ideal you know, political or social organization is. I got it. Um... And, and I actually think all of those different realms are quite important because they, um, they're, they're sort of um, uh, orthogonal ways of, of looking at, um, at the whole thing. Some, uh, some governments can be structures that it's, it's, there's, a, there's one that's autocratic over the other ones, but um, and many times we've had them overlapping in, 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 in power. You've had religious power concurrent um, with you had the Catholic Church and you had all, all the, the kings. Uh, right. in, the, in the Middle Ages concurrently, people, people forget that we have this system. Yeah, I think the distribution of power between those different types of institutions was actually uh, problematic and important. Um, and beca usually became progressively more problematic. Um, but like when you think about in the US, the separation of the state and the market, why we didn't just have a pure libertarian model. We had the idea of a, of a kind of liberal democracy, but also the separation of a state and a church. Um, then we say liberal democracy and kind of leave the role of the church out um, and mostly focus on market and, uh, and state. And yet, interestingly, you read all of the founding father comments about the need for people to have some kind of moral education as well as a um, you know, formal civic education for anything like democratic process to work. The way I think about that, and I'll, I'll mention the longer term one, um, but the way I think about that briefly is the reason that a state was put in place in this, in the kind of U.S. experiment um, was it was seen that markets could solve most problems or solve a lot of the problems in terms of innovation and efficiency, but that they also would lead to organized crime and they would lead to tragedy of the commons and different types of um, places where it was incentivized to do things that really created a shitty quality of life for everyone. So there was an idea that there was to be a state that had some kind of uh, ability to regulate the most predatory aspects of markets. Um, and so there was this idea of law and a monopoly of violence to be able to institute law that was based on jurisprudence, which is based on ethics, and which is why it, the, the founding documents are kind of existential ethical documents. And that's actually where the role of the church came in, which was we didn't want a single church having dominion over that, but the, the idea that there was philosoph the, the church and the academy, right, that there were deep considerations of what is a good life that is informing ethics, it's informing jurisprudence, it's informing law to be able to bind the predatory aspects of markets while facilitate the helpful aspects of markets simultaneously. And kind of the way I see it is that the markets, the predatory aspects were designed to be bound by the state, but the state was designed to be bound by a educated and engaged populace and where the state was of, for, and by the people and otherwise, you get the watchdog issue where you have maximum incentive for the market forces to capture the regulatory forces and then just get crony capitalism. But in order for – and then the people are actually bound by the market, which means accounting, that they can't ask for rights they aren't willing to take responsibilities for, and they can't you know, implement shit where the, where the accounting doesn't work out. And if you kind of think of that, there's a really nice balance in it, but it's easy to see how um, – Asymmetries of power emerge where even though there's aggregate symmetry between supply side and demand side, there's more coordination on supply side than there is on demand side. So you start getting asymmetric information warfares that lead to a less educated plus just natural human weakness at scale that lead to the population not checking the government and then the state force, the market force is capturing it. So I think there's some stuff that can be done to actually reverse this institutional decay and make a better version of this thing. And I'm actually very interested in that. I don't think it meets the sufficiency criteria long-term. And so then the question of what is a more visionary long-term distribution of power and choice making look like? I can say that I don't know because we haven't implemented it and the ideas that I have about it, I don't know if will work, but I, I have thoughts on this topic that have to do with um, one of the ways that 
I frame it up, if you think about If you think about kind of Jeffrey West's analysis and scale and the correspondence of that with kind of Dunbar society limits and the idea that in general intended groups of people, whether they're companies or countries, uh, get diminishing collective intelligence and productive capacity at scale beyond give or take in evolutionary tribal size then that ends up creating a basis for smaller groups to be more intelligent relative to the larger group. And you both have an incentive for defection and the capacity to defect and get away with it because the larger group becomes stupider and can't do the appropriate accounting. So you end up getting niches for sociopathic predatory behavior on this system. Whereas if you had linear development or super linear development of collective intelligence as a function of scale as you go above Dunbar number, you could have the group be smart enough to actually notice and bind the sociopathic defections where everyone would do better by being by participating with the collective intelligence system than defecting against it. Now, exactly how do we instantiate that? I, again, I think that goes, uh, it's a conversation I would love to have, a conversation I'd love to have with you. Um, that takes a much longer chunk of time. Okay, wow. Um, I, I realized that like the line of questions is just starting to ramp up. <laughs> um, uh, oh man, okay, how do we do this best? Um, uh, Danny, would you be able to say for one more question and then we cut it out? Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Yosha, maybe you do one more question and then uh, maybe Luke and Daniel, I can convince both of you to come on and uh, talk it out uh, on the next one together. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Yasha, I'll search for you. Yasha. Okay, I'm unmuting you now. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Daniel. This was amazing. It was a very wide range. I think that the uh, how to find the best system question seems to come down to um, something that might be eventually contradictory, like how can we combine the benefits of competent totalitarianism with the robustness and self-actualization and non-violence of a well-entrenched democracy? And uh, it's a, on top of a very diverse and pluralist Uh, population and society and cultural traditions. That, so that, that is a super difficult question and probably won't be able to solve it tonight. So a very simple question maybe in the end. What would happen if we take the present situation where the FDA is blocking testing and uh, is together with the CDC and some other institutions more or less directly responsible for the deaths of um, something like north of 90,000 Americans that would have, have to have died? Um, How can we solve that uh, in a situation, for instance, by forking the FDA? What would happen if California, for instance, forks the FDA and uh, the, F uh, the federal uh, agencies will look very grimly at us, but at the moment the situation seems to be a weakness of the federal government um, that would allow to renegotiate the distribution between federal and local power and create tighter feedback loops? Yeah. Um, I, I will also say, I don't know the answer to this. We'd need to look in it more depth, but a few thoughts that come to mind. I think states can do totally fucked up stuff and have people who are very power seeking at the level of states, even at the level of cities, but they don't have, like states don't have nukes, even though nukes might live in a state, the federal government does. And they don't, states have a national guard, but they don't have weapons of mass destruction and they don't have the same types of um, massive power consolidation. So I think the 10th Amendment is very important. And I think the movement to an increased, tenth, like when we talk about things that could get worse or better right now in the US, the idea that states become more relevant is actually a possibly very good idea with, while having the factor for right and left states moving in further apart directions and increased tension between them. So we, we have to factor for that, but that's mostly engineered. That's mostly narrative warfare engineered and could be addressed. But I do think taking it beyond the state down to the city level is better because cities are real things and states are fictions, just like nation states are fictions. Like where the boundary is, is 
was determined in a war or a trade or a whatever, but cities are based on the actual goods and services and transportation dynamics that need to be within a particular space of each other. So um, I think, and this is what Jeffrey West was showing in scale was that cities actually do have productive capacity that can be linear or super linear as a function of population. So I think having more governance at the level of cities uh, is very interesting. And then having coalitions of cities, network, network dynamics between cities, cities and the surrounding metropolitan areas pretty much defined by transportation dynamics. And there are obviously also tricky things where like, let's say we're dealing with a pandemic where let's say an area closes off its border and figures out how to become a green zone, but the other areas adjacent to it don't. Well, it doesn't actually get to reopen its border and reissue life without the other areas doing that or you know one person can cause the infections again so this is a place where the rights of individual places and their responsibility to each other are just so profoundly connected which is why this is such a big deal um i think one i think there's some stuff that's fucked up about the way tests have been blocked and rolled out i think i think there's a lot about it but i also think that there's a lot that's really bad about the tests like i don't think the amino assays are useful for test and trace um, or really diagnosis for suppression at all. There, it takes too many days from the time you were exposed and are infectious for the antibodies to show up. And the even, even if you have one that had very low false negatives at that point, and then there's too much that isn't known about what the antibodies actually mean yet or how long they last, their, the decay rate on them or any of those things. So I think we would need high sensitivity PCR that could be very, very widely utilized to be able to have testing really become very meaningful as a suppression strategy. Um, and so we're not waiting for antibody response in the blood. We're being able to detect presence of the virus in the mucosa. So, you know, nasal and oral swabs. Um, and I think, I think we could roll out specific areas could roll out those types of diagnostics and be able to show the effectiveness of it mostly commercially um, and with local government participation. And I think if it showed enough effectiveness, so like we're talking with some people in Las Vegas because Las Vegas is very focused on reopening because they're losing like a billion dollars a week per casino or whatever, staying closed. So they really want to reopen, but Vegas by itself reopening could cause the infection to never go away in the world because people come from all over, touch everything together in a closed air environment with circulated air and then fly back to the rest of the world. But they also have all the money to actually do the thing properly and the local government gets enough money from them they want to really participate. So they could roll out HEPA filters and PECO filters and nanotech surface treatments and detection mechanisms and get the security on them right and um, – and point of contact, rapid turnaround, PCR diagnostics, and actually be able to invest the capital to show the effectiveness to then be able to lower the economies of scale and the questions of if it's true or not to then get them implemented other places. So I'm interested in some of those approaches. Thank you so, so much for joining today. Um, I mean, uh, even though you stayed on for 45 minutes longer almost than intended, I think we've, again, just like very special service. So thank you so, so much for, uh, for, for actually joining. So bye-bye, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Daniel.